Testing, testing, testing. Can you hear me? I'm sorry that to be... Testing, testing, testing. That's good. Okay, well, it's very boring. And if I fumble with my papers, you'll know it's because I haven't got my lapel mic yet. But it is coming. So we'll probably have an unorthodox break in the middle while I get somebody very delicately fiddling to put on the mic, so let's hope. They always feel embarrassed when they have to do this. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, somebody said to me today at the film on Sebalt, which I know, Sebalt, which I know some of you were at, that they wanted to know why I'd chosen these five novels. Well, I thought I'd explain that, but I would certainly like to explain again. It's always fascinated me the way in which my notion of history, and of course you're dealing with an ignorant female perspective here, my notion of history is dictated largely by literature. And, and then I begin to think, well, maybe that's not a bad way of understanding literature, because I hope, as will become clear as we go along, that sometimes the reality that fiction portrays is more real to a person than that conveyed by the historical facts. And so I've tried to do a sort of quick whip through 19th and 20th and 21st century history by taking uh, incidents from, well, as you saw yesterday, the French wars against Russia. Today, it's going to be the financial scandals of mid-Victorian England in Anthony Trollope's novel, The Way We Live Now, and tomorrow it will be the First World War. Goodbye to all that, partly because I'm writing about Robert Graves, of course, and I'm using you as guinea pigs. And, um, and then we'll go on to Sebald himself, who's written the most amazing novel, Austerlitz, about the Holocaust, which for a lot of people conveys the reality of that Holocaust in very grim detail. And we'll finish with a picture of multicultural London, Britain, in which Zadie Smith talks in White Teeth about the effect of the mixing of an area like Wilsdon, one of the first in London to be so mixed. In fact, it has, as we discovered when we did two maps, it has the demographic of Cape Town. It's quite extraordinary, you'll see. I've, got, I've even got a little map for you to look at. So let's start then with Anthony Trollope and those financial scandals. A very different picture from the one portrayed yesterday. Yesterday you were in Russia and Austria. Today you're in London. Trollope himself had just come from Australia, but that's beside the point. I want to read you as a kind of comment, really, I hope, on the book itself, a poem by Wordsworth and his take on the materialism of the age in which he lived. He lived until 1850, and this novel was written in 1878, and it's number one on your sheets. Tell me if I'm holding the microphone <clears throat> too near to me. The world is too much with us, late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours, we have given our hearts away a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers, for this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. Have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. The way we live now is the 32nd, I hope you're going to be impressed by this, of Trollope's 46 novels. And regarded by most critics today in one of those curious switches of literary fortune as his finest achievement. Perhaps
perhaps because it has so many parallels in our own society, at least in Britain and America, and resonate, oh, I'm sure you're not guilty of financial scandals in Cape Town, <laughs> and resonates perhaps even more so than in Cape Town, judging from that laugh, and resonates with a wide variety of people. It was sparked off by Trollope's reaction to what has become known as the Panic of 1873, which swept America as well as Europe. Trollope had just returned, as I told you, from a long trip to Australia. He was trying to help his son wind up a failing sheep farm, an unlikely thing for a Victorian writer to be doing, I feel. And of course was all the more struck because he'd been away by this dramatic crisis, this dramatic series of financial scandals that was gripping London on his return. The panic itself triggered a depression in Europe and North America that lasted from 1873 until 1879. That was at, at its worst and even longer in some countries. In Britain, for example, it started two decades of stagnation, known as the Long Depression, that weakened the country's economic leadership. There were several underlying reasons for this. Post-war inflation, rampant speculation, overwhelmingly in railways, and for those of you, perhaps a few more than those of you who'd read War and Peace, for those of you who've read The Way We Live Now, and I do beg you to, it really is a good read, actually. Um, but as you know, if you have read the book, um, Melmot, the villain, the wonderful villain at the heart of this book is speculating in a, a non-existent <laughs> railway. Also to blame was a large trade deficit, the Franco-Prussian War, um, of 1871, to 70 to 71 had left um, this trade deficit. Property losses in America, all these factors had a massive um, effect in England and put a great strain on the bank reserves which plummeted in those areas affected. And curiously enough, and here I do feel that we're on home ground, the Construction of the Suez Canal, I know that's not home ground, but the construction of the Suez Canal, of course, meant that English ships and all sorts of ships in Europe didn't have to sail around the, the, um, the Cape of Good Hope. And the British particularly had benefited from this. They'd had British warehouses, which had stored um, all the goods that were needed along the way. But since sailing ships were not adapted to go through the Suez Canal, the wind went the wrong way, apparently, um, these trading posts and British business with it became defunct. It's interesting, isn't it, the knock-on effect of one thing on another. The results in Britain were a number of high-profile bankruptcies, escalating unemployment, a halt in public works, and a major trade slump that lasted until 1897, extraordinary amount of time. There were also a lot of rogues around to exploit the situation, one of whom, of course, is at the center of our novel. But in real life, there's a character who has been located by some literary sleuths called Abraham Gottheimer, who almost certainly inspired Trollope to create Melmot, the great swindler at the heart of the book. This particular real life fraudster, oh it's wonderful, it's almost as good as the novel that you're going to read. This particular real life fraudster had anglicized his name from Gottheimer to Grant. <laughs> I wonder why he did that. And Wangled probably bought a title, the title of Baron, from the king of, of, of Italy. That's true, actually. As Baron Grant, and this is even more extraordinary, he raised 24 million pounds of investment capital. That's a billions today. And threw a lavish dinner party for the Shah of Persia when he visited England. Just as Melmot in the novel lays on a, 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 an extraordinary Chinese feast for the Chinese emperor. Grant, 
Baron Grant then promptly blew 20 million pounds of his money on far-flung projects, like a silver mine in Utah, which is rather like Melmott's American-Mexican railway venture. He also got into Parliament, as Melmott does in the novel, as, can you doubt it, a Conservative member. And Trollope himself, that reminds me, had tried for Parliament and failed, though I'm glad to report as a Liberal member. <laughs> I have no political opinions. <laughs> Tolstoy was appalled, he wrote later, by a certain, and I'm quoting him, a certain class of dishonesty, dishonesty magnificent in its proportions and climbing into high places, so rampant, so splendid, that there seems to be reason for fearing that men and women will be taught to feel that dishonesty if it can become splendid, will cease to be abominable. <laughs> That's in his autobiography. Appearing, this novel appearing in monthly parts between February 1874 and September 1875, so of course at the height of the scandal, and one of the last Victorian novelist, novels to appear in monthly parts, interestingly enough, the Way We Live Now was published in book form in August 19, eight, sorry, 1875. Perhaps because of its grim subject matter, it wasn't nearly as popular as those novels that you're probably more familiar with, those of you who've read Trollope, the great Barchester Chronicles, those gentle tales of clerical life which we all love so much. Mr. Trollope, the critics said when they read this new kind of book, is so rarely inaccurate that we suppose there is somewhere a world like that which he describes. <laughs> and so somewhere among the marshes there is a sewage farm, and we would as soon go there for a breath of fresh air as to the way we live now for entertainment. They're very sniffy about the book. The Victorian public clearly preferred Trollope's earlier books those lovely, gentle books. Or even his political novels, the Palliser novels, which some of you may know, which focused largely on nobility and pleased a lot of people. Up to that point, Trollope had been regarded by his adoring public as a model of the Victorian literary man, the epitome of the best kind of 19th century writer Enormously hard working, besides writing 47 novels, he also wrote short stories, non fiction books, and worked full time in the post office as well. Can you imagine that? He was in touch with the interests of his day, a monument of productivity. His autobiography, however, published in 1883 the year after his death at the age of 67, revealed that he got up very early, between 5 and 5.30, and for three hours wrote a set number of words for an agreed amount of money, 3,000 pounds all told in the case of this book, all before setting out for work at the post office. That's what they mean by Victorian hard-working men. Yet this revelation in his autobiography, instead of impressing his readers, turned many of them against him and had a rather chilling effect. The writer, they felt, should be more romantic about writing, ideally divinely inspired and preferably living in a garret. So for many years, Trollope became the least popular of the Victorian giants, Dickens, um, Thackeray, George Eliot. It was only when it became clear in the 20th century that we were entering a new age of excessive greed and materialism and corruption, of course, to equal that of the mid-1870s in Victorian England that Trollope began to be of interest again and that his stock began to rise. He'd realized that his age was witnessing the creation of a different world. And in his view, 
almost certainly a worse one. Perhaps we all feel like that as we get older, I certainly do. Without any doubt, it was having some very adverse effects on other standards of morality. And in the way we live now, he tried to show what this new world was like. He talks about the hurry of the world, which is corroding old values. And some of his better characters say such things as, we belong to a, a newer and worse sort of world, or feel, quote, that the world was being changed very fast. Don't you feel like that sometimes? I certainly do. Characters are continually doing things in a spirit of cold calculation, which they would not have dreamt of doing 50 years before. Even the aristocracy, who have their standards, you understand, even the aristocracy wonder if perhaps they shouldn't be resisting this new world. There's a, a delightful character actually called Lord Nidderdale. He's meant to sound like a bit of a twit, Lord Nidderdale. Uh, he wonders whether to continue courting a young lady for her money after a scoundrel has let her down. Quote, he had an idea that a few years ago, a man could not have done such a thing, but, but that now it did not much matter what a man did. The ruthlessly efficient lawyer, Mr. Squirkham, who helps to expose Melmott in the end, only to better his own position, and not from any sense of right or wrong, is a sign, and this is a quote, in his way, that the old things are being changed. And when another of the aristocrats, or semi-aristocrats, Georgiana Longstaff, um, is, uh, is wondering whether she can get away with marrying a Jew, because in those days it was a very dangerous thing to do, she encounters, sorry, she encouraged her, herself with a vague notion that there was at present a general heaving up of society in this matter. So it's a period of great change, it's a period of lowering of what they thought of as moral standards. The recognition of Trollope's relevance to our own age rose sharply as the incidence of financial scandals increased with the advent of those well-known names, Robert Maxwell, Bernie Madoff, the Lehman Brothers disaster, and so on. There had been little in his most popular works, as I mentioned, those mild clerical intrigues, to prepare his readers to expect such blistering satire, and it is blistering satire, and not just on the materialism and dishonesty of the age, but also of its corrupt literary establishment and the snobbishness and prejudice of its upper classes. Nor was there much in his life to suggest such insights into the commercial world. He was not born into a banking family nor into a business family. He was born in 1815 into a family of four boys and two girls. He'd had an isolated, unhappy childhood. He's, he'd gone to Harrow Public School, but as a day boy with no money in rags, and he had not very good impressions of his childhood. Um, rather an exciting story, his mother Fanny, Fanny Trollope, whom some of you may even have heard of, uh, left for America with three of her children when Trollope was 11. He stayed behind with his father, and she left in an effort to save her family. His father, who had failed both as a barrister and a farmer, was unable to support them. And Fanny, too, failed initially to do so. She did wonderful things. She, went, she start, started by going first to a commune in Nashoba. Then, when she, then she opened a bazaar in Cincinnati. Aren't these Victorians amazing? They do the most extraordinary things. I mean, this is, she's coming and going across the Atlantic all this time. Trollope did not go to university and was generally regarded as a hopeless case. Um, even in a low-keyed job in the post office, his job was at risk because he owed too much money and hadn't paid his debts. But then in 1841, at the age of 26, 
he was posted to Ireland, and that did the trick. He loved Ireland, he loved its lightheartedness, its gaiety, its humour, and, which helped a lot, he fell in love with a woman. She wasn't Irish, but she was in Ireland. She probably put him, sorry, that's not, that's not the woman. <laughs> Though I do warn you, she doesn't look much better. <laughs> it's unfair because it's probably when she was a little bit older. Um, but he did, he fell, in, he fell in love with Rose Heseltine, who was from Yorkshire, and her, her father was over there working. And he loved, he loved Ireland's warmth. He loved the kind of friendliness of the people. And he also liked working in the post office in Ireland and became much better at his job. He used to go, occasionally, he would go to the lost letter box for ideas for novels. I think that's a very good idea. He also, now he didn't invent the, the pillar box, but he introduced the pillar box into the English postal, the British postal system. And you thought it was originally red. Well, it was originally green. And not just because it was in Ireland either. Um, but the post office was good to him and, and valued him and it made him a cosmopolitan, sending him around the world in 1858 to Egypt and Palestine, then to Malta, Gibraltar, and Spain, and on business to the West Indies and Central America. He also went several times to the USA after the Civil War. But while there's little in Trollope's early life to suggest this hard-hitting satirist that he would become, it's clear that his mother's decision to take up writing had a very strong influence on him. She took up writing professionally when he was 15 or 16. I think she deserves a lecture on her own, Fanny Trollope. Um, and Fanny Trollope rapidly made a name for herself with her books, obviously an extraordinarily enterprising woman. Her husband died in 1835, the year after Anthony Trollope started work in the post office, and so she was left sole breadwinner. In all, Fanny Trollope wrote over 100 books, 40 of them novels, before her death, aged 84 in 1863. Let a book be as bad as it will, I shall get something for it. She is reported to have said, and she would turn her hand to almost anything. Her most successful book was called Domestic Manners of the Americans, 1832. Not very complimentary, sold out in England, of course. <laughs> but she was more than just a mercenary writer. She also voiced principles. And her most interesting book, which you may have not have heard of, but I think is fascinating, Life and Adventures, of Jonathan Jefferson Whitlaw in 1836, one of the first anti-slavery novels, which preceded and was said to have influenced Harriet Beecher Stowe's work, much better known work, Uncle Tom's Cabin, in 1852. She was also a feminist before her time, and another side to her, which almost certainly influenced Antony and if you read Anthony's novels, as, as I will go on to point out, you will find a lot of very strong women in those novels. She was insatiably curious, and as a writer, always had an eye for the telling detail, which, of course, Trollope himself has. It's hard not to see her influence behind Trollope's initial attempt at this novel, The Way We Live Now. We know that he referred to this novel first as the Carberry novel. Now, Carberry is the name of Lady Carberry, a coquettish, attractive, 40-something operator, as one English critic calls her, I like that 40-something operator. False from head to foot, according to Trollope, who is hoping to save her family from financial ruin by writing books. Does that remind you of anything? Um, 
She's not, I think, a very good writer. In fact, we know she's not a very good writer. And the book opens initially as an attempt to write about the literary world and to satirize it. I'll just read you a bit. This is extract two. Let the reader, it says, be introduced to Lady Carberry, upon whose character and doings much will depend of whatever interests these pages may have. As she sits at her writing table in her own room, in her own house in Welbeck Street, Lady Carberry spent many hours at her desk and wrote many letters, wrote also very much besides letters. She spoke of herself in these days as a woman devoted to literature, always spelling the word with a big L. Something of the nature of her devotion may be learned by the perusal of three letters, which on this morning she had written with a quickly running hand. Lady Carberry was rapid in everything and in nothing more rapid than in the writing of letters. And then he, he gives you letter one. This letter, having read the letter, was addressed to Nicholas Brown Esquire, the editor of the Morning Breakfast Table, a daily newspaper of high character, and as it was the longest, so it was considered to be the most important of the three. <laughs> you, you notice the satire there. Just because it's longer, it's more important. Mr. Brown was a man powerful in his profession and he was fond of ladies. Lady Carberry, in her letter, had called herself an old woman, but she was satisfied to do so by a conviction that no one else regarded her in that light. Her age shall be no secret to the reader, though to her most intimate friends. Even to Mr. Brown, it had never been divulged. She was 43, but carried her years so well and had received such gifts from nature that it was impossible to deny that she was still a beautiful woman. And she used her beauty not only to increase her influence, as is natural to women who are well favored, but also with a well-considered calculation that she could obtain material its assistance in the procuring of bread and cheese, which was very necessary to her, by a prudent adaptation to her purpose of the good things with which providence had endowed her. She did not fall in love. She did not willfully flirt. She did not commit herself, but she smiled and whispered and made confidences, and looked out of her own eyes into men's eyes, as though there might be some mysterious bond between her and them, if only mysterious circumstances would permit it. But the end of all was to induce someone to do something which would call a publisher to give her good payment for indifferent writing, or an editor to be lenient when upon the merits of the case he should have been severe. Beautifully written, I think, isn't it? I'm not suggesting that Lady Carberry is an exact portrait of Trollope's mother. I'm sure she wasn't quite such a bad writer. But she probably lies behind, as I've already suggested, her son's attraction to strong, determined women, most of them admirable, despite their, their flaws. Lady Carberry, for instance, is full of faults, undeniably. Her self-pity, her unkind treatment of her devoted daughter, Henrietta, who's called Hetta, her self-delusion, her cunning and calculating behavior, her worship of money, which she adores, her snobbishness, but she's also partly redeemed by a genuine love for her wastrel son, who will loom large in certain parts of the novel, Sir Felix Carberry. He's almost a caricature. In fact, I would risk saying that he is. And also, she's redeemed by her increasing tenderness for Mr. Brown, who predictably falls in love with her. And then, perhaps her greatest quality of all, she's extremely perceptive and realistic, as that passage shows she's very industrious and very determined. And she takes up writing to support her family, she's going to support her family. One sign of Trollope's tolerance towards her seems to me that he allows her, in the course of the novel, to develop 
and so in the end, he, she is permitted to marry Mr. Brown. She's become worthy of that kind of ending. An even stronger character, whom Trollope portrays even more sympathetically, perhaps despite himself, is the mysterious, very beautiful American woman, Mrs. Hurtle in the novel, who has followed Paul Montague, a young man now in love with Henrietta Carberry, and she with him, from what Trollope calls the wild west of America to London. Though Paul has tried to terminate their relationship, she appeals to him very skillfully and movingly not to abandon her, a woman alone in London. When you hear about her history, you realize that she doesn't need any protection at all. Trollope is quite ready to hint at what Mrs. Hurtle's rather colorful faults are, including the fact that she has lied about the death of her husband, an already existing husband. She, she thinks another marriage would come in rather handy at this point, and of course, if she's already married, she can't marry again. That doesn't matter, he's dead. Um, and there is also another rumor that she may have shot a man in Oregon and would do it again. As Trollope puts it, everybody knew that she was very clever and very beautiful, but everybody also thought that she was very dangerous. She's also undeniably calculating and manipulative and can be very vengeful, as the man in Oregon must have realized a little too late. Roger Carberry, Hetta's gentlemanly, worthy, but rather dull cousin, who's also in love with Hetta and furious that his ward, Paul Montague, is pursuing her too, greatly disapproves of Mrs. Hurtle and what he thinks and thinks of her as a wild cat, her wild cat American ways. He pictured to himself all American women, Trollope says, as being loud, masculine, and atheistical. <laughs> but Trollope, who was himself at least half in love with a feisty American woman, Kate Fields, seems reluctant to part with Mrs. Hurtle in this novel. Even when Paul has managed to convince her that he will not, um, that he will not marry her, Trollope allows her to remain in the book. A kindly deus ex machina, a god coming out of the clouds to arrange the flighty Ruby Ruggles marriage. Ruby Ruggles is a, a, a rustic character in the book to another rustic, John Crumb with a heart of gold. The most unlikely strong woman in the way we live now is the initially rather pathetic Mary Melmot, daughter of the great wheeler dealer, Augustus Melmot. Seen first only as a commodity in the, in the marriage market because her father has a great deal of money. In fact, we readers know that Melmot has no money and one of the central themes of the book is the way in which the thought that you have money, the belief that you have money, is as good as having the money itself. And that the whole of Melmot's empire is built on this credulity of the people around him in his greatness, in his ability to raise the money. He has no money and yet he convinces people to buy shares in his non-existent railway. It's, it's extremely um, surrealistic at times, this novel. But his daughter is seen to be a very wealthy woman because she's going to inherit all this so-called um, money. And to begin with, she's just this little daughter doing what her father tells her. But she develops into one of the most admirable characters in the book. She's one of the few to defy her father. Her father has, when he did have some money, he put it into her name, of course, so that he, he wouldn't have to admit that he had any money and then she won't give it him back again. 
some of the best scenes in the book are Marie saying, no, you gave it to me, it's my money now. She's intelligent, honest, direct, and brave, and like most of the characters, characters Trollope approves of, is seen to mature during the course of the book. I think it's one of those um, signs of approval in his novels that the character is allowed to develop. Only people who, who are capable of development are seen as really positive characters. And she's allowed a meager allowance of happiness at the end, when she marries, more as a business arranged than anything else, uh, she marries the American developer with a wonderful name of Hamilton K. Fisker. I don't know how he does it. The, the names in, in Trollope are wonderful. Only one of a, an array of wonderful names, almost as good as Dickens, I would say, perhaps sometimes as good. What better name for a sleazy gentleman's club than the Bear Garden, which is taken over eventually by the appropriately named Mr. Flat Fleece. <laughs> or what more suitable name for a family solicitor, dozy family solicitor, slow and bide a while. <laughs> Their opponent, who is young and thrusting, is called Squirkum. I particularly enjoyed the information that the devious and snobbish friend of Georgiana Longstaff, now successfully married to Sir Damask Monogram, <laughs> was originally a Miss Julia Triplex. I don't know why that name seems to me to do the trick, but it does. There's some, something tricky about it, isn't it? While Melmoth himself is reminiscent, as some of you will already have thought, of Melmoth the Wanderer, because there's always a question throughout this novel, is he Jewish? Something that wasn't quite approved of at the time. Um, Melmoth the Wanderer, a novel by the Irish writer Charles Mat Maturin, published in 1820, only two decades before Trollope arrived in Ireland, which has links to the legend of the wandering Jew, so there may be a clue there. I could go on with the names, but I won't. <laughs> Both Melmot and his daughter, Marie, quickly take control and central stage in the novel. Well, she doesn't take control, but she certainly takes central stage. As it progresses with Melmot's shady dealings, rapidly taking precedence over Lady Carberry's struggles to make money from her writing. So that though the book had started as a satire on the literary world, with other gentler digs at the church on the way, this second strand of the plot, revolving round Melmot's undoubtedly um, shady dealings, becomes the main one, as his towering figure threatens to overshadow all the other characters. With the introduction of Melmot, one of English fiction's most memorable villains, all literary equilibrium disappears, the critic Roger McCrum says. I love that, all literary e equilibrium disappears. For Melmot is a larger than life character who nevertheless manages to convince us that he is real. A bit like Bolkonsky, whom I mentioned yesterday. He must be real, he's so impossible. <laughs> somebody, somebody I think is reminded of somebody she knows here. <laughs> he seems to suck the air. Do you know those people who suck the air out of a room when they go into it? Certainly most of the other male characters in the way we live now seem very, very tame by comparison. The cowardly, dishonest and exploitative Sir Felix Cow uh, Carberry, incapable of anything but drinking, gambling, squandering money, entirely unappreciative of his mother's sisters, Marie Melmotts and Ruby Ruggles' sacrifices on his part. He's a man who really doesn't deserve even his mother's love. Paul Montague, who loves Hetta, remember? Sorry, some of you will have problems following this plot. Paul Montague, basically decent, but incapable of firm action, required of him until the end of the book and that worthy but unexciting English gentleman, Roger Carberry. Um, lovely comment by Walter Allen in his very useful book on the novel. 
who thinks uh, Roger Carberry the weakest character in the novel, novel, for such, he remarks perceptively, is the fate of the good man in fiction. It's true, isn't it? I mean, think of Milton's Paradise Lost and how the devil gets all the good parts. I mean, it's, it's, it's very true. Walter Allen claims that Roger is there only to express Trollope's views. Um, and I think he's, he's right. It's, it's Roger Carberry who says, what are we coming to? when such a man as Melmott is an honored guest at our tables. And of course, everybody has been seduced by his money, except Roger. But one of Trollope's many strengths is his, is his ability to present his characters, as well as his situations, in the round. And he also allows a very different view of Melmott to be given by an equally colorful female character in the drama, whom I've just mentioned, Mrs. Hurtle, a representative of the new world, where, of course, making money in the way that Melmot makes money is perhaps not frowned upon quite so snobbishly as it is in England. Mrs. Hurtle, who tells Paul, I, would, I, I can't do an American accent, I'm afraid. Shall I just kind of every now and again slip an Americanism into it? <laughs> I would sooner see that man than your queen. No, I can't do it. Or any of your dukes or lords. They tell me that he holds the world of commerce in his right hand. What power, what grandeur. Grand enough, says the Englishman Paul, if it came honestly. Such a man rises above honesty, said Mrs. Hurtle, as a great general rises above humanity when he sacrifices an army to conquer a nation. Such greatness is incompatible with small scruples. A pygmy man is stopped by a little ditch, but a giant stalks over rivers. I prefer to be stopped by ditches, said Paul. <laughs> I, you've, you've got the flavor. There is, as, um, as uh, Alan notes, a magnificent fairness in Trollope. There's no either or, there is this and that existing side by side simultaneously. For most of, of the novel, I found myself agreeing with Paul Montague that Melmot is, quote, as vile a scoundrel as ever lived, as his heartlessness towards his daughter, Marie, is shown. His dishonesty and unscrupulousness in business selling shares in a railway that doesn't exist. I'm always fascinated by that, you know. I, I, I questioned my husband about the stock exchange. I said, but how can you sell shares in defunct Siberian salt mines? I think money is a fascinating subject, and it's right here in the middle of this novel that, you know, you really can sell what you don't have. It's, I, no, I'm, I'm too straightforward. <laughs> um, Acquiring, he acquires Mr. Longstaff's house without paying for it, then pulls it down so he can't give it him back again. He's increasingly arrogant throughout the novel, following his election as an MP and his decision to give an elaborate dinner for the Chinese emperor, and he becomes megalomaniac as all this develops. Roger Carberry, one of the few measures of decency in the book, argues that Melmott's meteoric rise is a sign of the degeneracy of the age. But when, as his right-hand man Kroll so vividly imagines, he becomes so puffed up with his own importance that he explodes, I find myself beginning to pity him. And I suspect that his creator Trollope felt sorry for Melmott too, judging from his comments after his suicide. A plea of insanity had not been allowed at the inquest, so he's committed suicide. No, they say he isn't insane and therefore cannot be buried in church ground. He was, Trollope tells us, carried away to the crossroads or elsewhere. But it may be imagined, he goes on, I think that during that night, he may have become as mad 
the night when he's contemplating suicide. He may have become as mad as any other wretch, have been driven as far beyond his powers of endurance as any other poor creature who ever at any time felt himself constrained to go. He had not been so drunk but that he knew all that had happened and could foresee pretty well what would happen. The summons to attend upon the Lord Mayor had been served upon him. There were some among them, Kroll and Mr. Bregert, who absolutely knew he had committed forgery. He had no money for the long starts, and he was well aware that Squirkham would do at once. He had assured himself long ago, he had assured himself indeed not very long ago, that he would be brave and he would brave it all like a man. But we none of us know what load we can bear and what would break our backs. Melmott's back had been so utterly crushed that I almost think that he was mad enough to have justified a verdict of temporary insanity. Even before his lonely death, there's something about him which becomes increasingly pathetic and invites our sympathy. And one even begins to feel a slight admiration for him as he faces his inevitable end. His courage in the face of mounting adversity, his coolness under pressure, when the partial boycotting of his feast for the Chinese Empire, emperor at, alerts him to danger, his pride in his achievements, especially his election to Parliament, all of this makes him a more sympathetic character. Discussing him in Parliament, after rumours of his impending arrest reaches the House of Commons, one minister says to another, he's a ruined man, I suppose, to which the reply is, I doubt whether he ever was a rich man, but I'll tell you what, he has been the grandest rogue we've seen yet. And there is that feeling about him. I mean, when he, when he takes his last meal, he walks into the House of Commons and no one will sit with him. And is he going to turn around and go out? No. He spoke loudly to the waiters. He sits down in his seat, spoke loudly to the waiters, drank his bottle of champagne with much apparent enjoyment. Since his friendly intercourse with Nidderdale, no one had spoken to him, nor he had spoken to any man. They who watched him declared among themselves that he was happy in his own audacity. But in truth, he was probably at that moment the most utterly wretched man in London. He would have been better studying his personal comfort had he gone to his bed and spent his evening in groans and wailings. But even he with all the world now gone from him, with nothing before him but the extremest misery which the indignation of offended laws could inflict. Even he was able to spend the last moments of his freedom in making a reputation at any rate for audacity. It was thus that Augustus Melmott wrapped his toga around him before his death. I love that toga, don't you? <laughs> Melmott is one of Trollope's most brilliant creations in a book full of memorable characters. Um, and I think probably the fact that he can create characters like that has rather overshadowed the fact that he's also a very good stylist. I don't know whether you found some of those passages humorous. I mean, there's, there's a great deal of skill involved. Henry James was rather condescending about him. Henry James, who of course is the exact opposite of the loose baggy monster of a novel that, that Trollope wrote, Henry James wrote condescendingly, fairly sort of approvingly, but, but condescending. His great, his inestimable merit was a complete, a complete appreciation of the usual. He, and, and it's true, isn't it? He felt all daily and immediate things as well as he saw them, felt them in a simple, direct, salubrious way, 
with their sadness, their gladness, their charm, their comicality, all their obvious and measurable meanings. Trollope will remain one of the most trustworthy, though not one of the most eloquent of writers. I don't agree with James, actually, who have helped the heart of man to know itself. Um, not the most eloquent of, I think he's extremely eloquent. <laughs> I'm sorry to disagree with my, um, my hero, Henry James, but I do. Uh, it makes Trollope's writing sound a bit like sliced white bread, doesn't it? You know, compared with a good crusty brown loaf. I, I really don't think it's fair. I like what um, Nathaniel Hawthorne said, the, you know, the author of The Scarlet Letter. And he wrote to his, I think he wrote to his, was it his, to his publisher, have you ever read the novels of Anthony Trollope? Yes, he wrote to his publisher in 1860. They precisely suit my taste. Solid, substantial, written on the strength of beef and through inspiration of ale, and just as real, just as real as if some giant had hewn a great lump out of the earth and put it under a glass case with all its inhabitants going on about their daily business and not suspecting that they were made a show of. Don't you think that's lovely? <laughs> I love that one. For Trollope's style has its very real strengths. His dialogue and sense of drama make his characters breathe. The English novelist Amanda Craig claimed if he lacks she goes on, the grand bow-wow strain and language of Dickens, his ear for the way real people speak is impeccable. Even here, I feel Trollope's style is not being fully appreciated. It's a wonderful vehicle. It's capable of expressing happiness, humor, satire, misery, and all sorts of other things. And we saw that in the opening account, I hope, the humor of the passage on Lady Carberry. And although it's rarely highly rhetorical or showy in the way Dickens sometimes is, and although I have to admit he cannot reach Dickens's poetic heights, that amazing ability to create symbols like the fog at the opening of, of Bleak House or the opening of Great Expectations, although Trollope isn't capable of that, he's capable of some memorable passages. I'd like to read you just one passage to illustrate this, and that's extract eight on your, on your, which shows you his ability to write in an extended metaphor, which really conveys what poor Georgiana Longstaff is feeling. Like many young ladies getting on a little bit, she's worried that nobody's going to marry her. And of course, this mattered more in Victorian times than it probably does today. And she feels as though she is drowning. Marriage had ever been so clearly placed before her eyes as a condition of things to be achieved by her own efforts, that she could not endure the idea of remaining tranquil in her father's house and waiting till some fitting suitor might find her out. She had struggled and struggled, struggling still in vain till every effort of her mind, every thought of her daily life was pervaded by a conviction that as she grew older from year to year, the struggle would be more intense. The swimmer, when he first finds himself in the water, conscious of his skill and confident in his strength, can make his way through the water with the full command of all his powers. But when he begins to feel that the shore is receding from him, that his strength is going, that the footing for which he pants is still far beneath his feet, that there is peril where before he had contemplated no danger. Then he begins to beat the water with strokes rapid but impotent and to waste in anxious gaspings the breath on which his very life must depend. So it was with poor Gregory, sorry, poor Georgie Longstaff, 
Something must be done at once or it would be of no avail. Twelve years had been passed by her since first she plunged into the stream, the twelve years of her youth. And she was as far into the so as far as ever from the bank, nay farther, if she believed her eyes. She too must strike out with rapid efforts, unless indeed she would abandon herself and let the waters close over her head. But immersed as she was here at Caversham, how could she strike at all? Even now, the waters were closing upon her. The sound of them was in her ears. The ripple of the waves was already round her lips, robbing her of breath. Ah, uh, might there not be some last great convulsive effort which might dash her on the shore, even if it were upon the rock? That ultimate failure in her matrimonial projects would be the same as drowning. She never for a moment doubted. It's extraordinary, isn't it, the way he keeps that going? Uh, and I don't know how many of you are very, very good swimmers, but I'm not. And I know that feeling. <laughs> when the shore's just a little bit too far away for me to feel as confident as when I started. Trollope's style, then, is, is a very, very um, impressive thing, and so his array of characters. But what I would like to end with is a consideration of the themes of this book. So it's a story very well told, and I do promise you, you will want to go on reading it and thank me for having suggested it, if you start. But the themes themselves, particularly, of course, that central theme of money. And W.H. Auden, the poet W.H. Auden, an unlikely admirer of Trollope, claimed that of all novelists in any country, Trollope best understands the role of money. Compared with him, even Balzac is a romantic. Balzac wrote a great deal about, about money, didn't he? Money and considerations of money not only dominate public affairs at all levels, they also eat deeply into private relationships. I mean, we saw this with Marie, abused, lonely, callously exploited by nearly everyone. And she reveals what she's learned from her London experience when she says, I don't think I'll marry anybody. What's the use? It's only money. Nobody cares for anything else. In this new world, particularly this new London, Trollope projects in this novel with an unprecedented thoroughness and accumulative power, um, that power of money. Uh, which has been underestimated, certainly in this new world brought about by the financial scandals. As one American critic remarked on reading The Way We Live Now, Trollope would probably roll over in his grave to see obeisance paid to Wall Street CEOs who, unlike Tolstoy's protagonist, Wilmot, seem to have pulled off their high-class pyramid schemes. Of course, people do get away with these scandals, don't they? And it's a very moral novel because Melmot doesn't. Although, as I confess to you, I do feel sympathy for him in the end. I wonder what Trollope would have made of Wall Street, one of my favorite films. Don't you think it's an extraordinary portrayal of the world of money? With Gordon Gecker's famous remark, which my husband and I always remind one another of, Greed is good. <laughs> <laughs> and as Trollope's initial plan for his novel to center around Lady Carberry's, together with the strands of the plot concerning her daughter Hetta, Mrs. Hurtle, Marie Melmott, and Ruby Ruggles show, another very interesting theme in this book is the position of women. And the position of women in the Victorian period, and how strong you would have to be as a woman to rise above all the condescension and control that was exercised over, over them. And of course, the outsider, Mrs. Hurtle, has the greatest freedom of movement in the book. Class is also equally important. 
Mel Melmot is ready to marry his daughter to an aristocrat, the understanding being that she will supply his non-existent money. And of course, that went on in England, didn't it, towards the end of the 19th century, where American heiresses, Henry James and Edith Wharton are full of them, American heiresses came over and married English aristocrats who were, of course, impoverished. So we do have that. Um, and so we've got a lot, of, a lot of themes. I haven't mentioned all of them. Um, the, but one important theme, I think, and I really haven't got time to, to, to tell you more about this, is the theme of attitudes towards Jewishness and Jews. And one of the characters, as you know, Georgiana, is desperate to marry. And the only person who will look at her, because her family has no money, is the Jewish banker, Bregert who resists all the stereotypes and is in the world of money, but manages somehow to convey an integrity that we learn to respect. He's a wonderful character. And he says to her, you know, I'm, I have been married, I'm widowed, I have three children or whatever it is, um, but I would, I would love you to be my wife. And she's so desperate, this is a comment of course on the age, that she accepts him and her father, when he finds out, goes completely berserk. But um, the dignity with which Bregert, one of the few honest men in the book, accepts this decision not to marry him, shows, I think, that Trollope himself was free from that prejudice, that anti-Semitism, which was so pervasive in England. Well, I could go on, as you know, but I'm going to just finish very quickly with a comment by Trollope himself. Victoria Glendinning, who's written a good biography of um, the way we live now, described it as a great shout in the long conversation that Anthony Trollope sustained and sustains with his readers about all the betrayal of all that is honest and true. And that takes us back to Trollope's own words, some of which I quoted at the beginning. If dishonesty, he writes, if dishonesty can live in a gorgeous palace with pictures on its walls and gems in all its cupboards, with marble and ivory in all its corners and can give a Piscean dinners and get into parliament and deal in millions, then dishonesty is not disgraceful. And a man dishonest after such a fashion is not a low scoundrel, instigated, I say, by some such reflections as these. I sat down in my new house to write the way we live now. <laughs>